All right, everybody who has tuned in, welcome to another great training webinar from Equipment Zone. I'm Jay Bissell, and I will be joined shortly by my two expert guests, Terry Combs and Roy Huseman. Both are affiliated uh, with Equipment Zone, of course. And today's training is going to be all about pre treating and the pre treatment cycle is critical to success. And so, Terry, how are you doing, my friend? Are you well? I'm doing great, Jay. Looking forward to uh, another webinar talking about our index for that uh, getting that trade show look on your on your shirts. That's right. This is an extension of our Easy DTG Print Index. We've created an index to help us both actually in in technical support as well as in sales because we want to set the expectations and, and do a fair job of that and uh and it's an extension of that article that you wrote so long ago right you think about that you still hear me are you with me terry uh oh terry's terry's checking his back i just remembered that terry had written an article uh a couple of i want to say a couple of years ago terry and uh, he'll figure out his audio that's fine and and uh he because we get so many questions how how come my t-shirts don't look like those t-shirts and so uh it, it gave us the the starting point or the genesis for creating some training videos and then this is just the culmination of that so this is an opportunity for us to dive in a little bit deeper and we've got roy standing by roy can you hear me okay sure can there he is can you guys hear me all right Yep, you're, you're looking good. You're sounding good. We're ready to dive in on pre-treatment. We've got lots of examples. We're going to go back and forth between uh, the monitors. We're going to go back and forth between some slides. And then at the end of this session, we're going to show some live pre-treating. So I feel lucky today, not because uh, uh, of anything I've done, but I do want to share one thing. I've had this shirt now. I've, I, I printed this shirt with a little bit of help from Roy at the DTG Training Academy. It's been officially washed and dried 20 times. And check it out, ladies and gentlemen. Dun, dun, dun. Do Looks I, do fabulous. I, do I go side to side? <laughs> Should I flex? <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice blend in that. Yeah, it's got a good gradient. It came out great. And I'm just, every time it comes out of the dryer, I'm just like, I can't believe it's still this bright. Um, so anyway. I don't know how that ties in, but I'm excited, as you can tell, and that's not surprising to any of you if you've been around me for a day or two. Um, the good news is I'm going to be asking and framing the questions, and Terry and, and Roy will be giving the, you know, their experience and the answers. And so we'll get started with that before we jump into any slides. Um, Terry, if we can start with this question, this is the first question. As we, as we think about the how critical is pretreatment, then it leads to, well, why do we need pretreatment? And so maybe you could touch on that, like <laughs> set the stage you, for us. Yeah, you know, and I apologize, my audio went out for just a moment there, which I'm sure you uh, realized as you were talking to me. But uh, the, um, the, the first of all, we get this question a lot. Uh, do you have to treat pretreat? With the Epson printer, do you have to pretreat? Uh, implying that you don't have to pretreat with other machines. Uh, I think it's one of the things that, that back when we did trade shows that that some people would just skip over and wouldn't give you that information. But uh, uh, the reason you have to pretreat is basically uh, just like in screen printing. When I print a, a, a let's say a navy t-shirt, I'm going to print white. I'm going to flash that ink for about 15 seconds to gel it. And then I'm going to come back and print colors on top. And it's really the same process. Uh, the pre-treat on the shirt when the white ink touches, it will start to cure. And that's how we can get white ink to stay up on top of the shirt. But, you know, unlike a lot of other uh, things, uh, other types of decoration, pre-treating is a critical part of this process. If you don't have your shirt pre-treated properly, you're never gonna get that bright uh, print that, that you see at the trade show. So it's it's critical to the process. And, and I know that, uh, that Roy is gonna have some examples of, of how to do this properly and uh, and you know, I think that a lot of companies don't emphasize it enough. And, and so people struggle with the, with the process. Yeah, no, it comes up all the time. And that's why we also have Roy here. Hopefully we won't go too far down the technical support rabbit hole. But at the same time, Roy brings a wealth of knowledge. And I know, Roy, you get this question all the time. You know, you think about why do we pre-treat? Do I have to pre-treat? Do all DTG printers pre-treat? So maybe, maybe you've got something that you can add to that. 
Well, basically, as uh, Terry mentioned, with the white shirts, uh, you, you're required to pre-treat to keep that white on the surface of the fabric. Now, on uh, light-colored shirts where I'm not putting a white base, uh, am I going to pre-treat? It depends on what I'm printing. If I'm just printing type on a shirt, I'm going to put more density to the ink. It's quicker, it's cheaper, and it takes one step out of the process. Now, scenarios where I would pre-treat a white shirt is if I'm doing anything that's going to uh, be very absorbent, like hoodies, tote bags, um, or if I'm printing something on a t-shirt that's high quality, a, a picture of somebody, or has a lot of detail and I want to hold that, then I'm going to go ahead. And the other thing is, when you have light colors next to dark colors, you're going to bleed. Okay, if I have black type next to yellow or something of that nature, black is going to bleed into other colors if I don't pre-treat, okay? There well, are ways that's around a great, that that's within a great Garment point. Creator. Yeah, no, sorry, I didn't mean uh, to cut you off. That's a great Oh, point. no problem. Yeah. There's ways around that with Garment Creator, but, okay. uh, you know, we go through that in training and show you how to either not pre-treat a white shirt or uh, if you need to pre-treat a white shirt, why would be the reasons to do that? And I know, Terry, that some of our, some of our folks listening in today are going to think, okay, well, so does it come down to preference then? I mean, maybe you could shed some light on that because sometimes it, and it really, people say Yeah, that. it really does. Uh, and and, and uh, Roy, when you started, you said, when you have a white shirt, you have to pre-treat. I think what you meant to say with white ink, you have to pre-treat. So just that's so that our, our listeners yeah. can- Oh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, My apologies, sure that we that's didn't. what I meant. <laughs> hey, um, we knew what you meant, we just want to be clear. Yeah, so, the, the, so the question is, uh, you know, should I pre-treat a white shirt if I'm only printing CMYK? Um, and and I, I think it really is a matter of preference and it's, it's a matter of who your audience is. You know, if, if, if uh, somebody comes in uh, to my shop and they want a picture of the, of the five grandkids under the Christmas tree on a white t-shirt, I'm going to, I'm going to print that shirt. I'm going to bring it out and, and uh, grandma's going to go, oh, that's awesome. And then I'm going to pre-treat a shirt and print the same print and lay it down next to it. And she goes, well, that's even a little better. Better. Well, you know, you kind of had me at awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. from, from a production standpoint, uh, you know, and again, we, we have a we have a, a, an associate in California that prints for artists. Well, you know what? Yes, he pre-treats all his shirts because an artist wants to make sure that the colors and everything are perfectly true. So uh, I, I'm going to say that probably a small majority of Equipment Zone customers do not pre-treat white shirts, but it, it totally depends on your marketplace. And, and, uh, and of course, yes, Roy and, and every technician we have is going to say, oh, you, you absolutely have to. Uh, and, and because they want you to get the absolute best quality print possible um, for you out there who are, who are, you know, trying to make a living, maybe that's something that you do or you don't want to do. It's a little bit more time. You're probably looking at 15 or 20 cents in, in pre-treat costs for a, for a light color shirt. And, and we'll talk a little bit about different types of pre-treat as well as we go along here. That'll come up here in a minute. I know, I know Roy's got a sh shirt he wants to show us, but before we do that, I want to acknowledge David. Yeah. David asked a great question about nozzles getting clogged. David, we have a video specifically for that to talk about the best way to keep those nozzles clean, how to, how to, you know, maintain that um, specific for the pre-treater, the speed treater TX that we make and manufactured equipment zone. So I'll make sure that Roy, uh, it, it's in the chat and we can follow up with David and send him a link. Also, Lisa talked about, you know, should I use more than one coat of pre-treatment? We're going to answer that question in a little bit so that you can get to the bottom of that as well. So good questions. Thank you, everybody. I am watching a little bit of the chat. Roy, what's that shirt you're holding up? Uh, well, getting back to what uh, Terry was just saying. In reference to pre-treat, the inks are going to bleed into each other, creating a different look on color. As he mentioned, to get a more vibrant color, you need to pre-treat the shirt. If you look at that swatch there, the R191, G191, you yep. can kind of see a pattern in there, okay? Now I'm gonna show you, a sh on the other side, we pre-treated, that same shirt, whoops. Here, there it is, a little bit more. Yep. 
you can red see how much more. green 191. Yeah, it's brighter and there's no white showing through. Well, the other one, it shows a pattern because it's bleeding. It's almost like a peppering kind of look or where the colors are not completely laying down right. And that's what happens when you don't pre-treat. But again, you know, it's it's uh, based on preference. Again, so and there you go, it's just based on preference. And, and so if we have lights to whites and, you know, pastels in that range, there are gonna be some people that say, I don't pre-treat, but it's gonna, it's gonna vary. It's gonna vary on the quality that they're after. It's gonna vary on the substrate that they're printing and the expectation of the end user. So there's no way for us to say 100% always pre-treat or to say, well, you never have to pre-treat on whites because both would be incorrect. There is going to be mm -hmm. some preference. And as we've always stated at Equipment Zone, test, test, test. So take the time to learn why, just like what Roy just shared with us, to hold up that shirt and see the difference between the exact same print on a white t-shirt and what would it look like with or without pretreatment? So we're gonna we're gonna go through some of those samples as well. Terry, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the actual pretreat solution? Like, what is this magic secret sauce? <laughs> it is magic, and it is. It, it, I'm gonna share the the big secret with you. Uh, there are binders in there that are specific to to your ink system that helps bond that that ink to the fabric. But it, it's basically a saltwater solution. So the secret ingredient covers three fifths of the uh, of the earth, uh, salt water. And so let's think about that a little bit. So we're we're applying pre-treat the shirt. And, and as I said, there are binders that are specific to, to particular ink systems. But basically what we have on a shirt is, is a, a layer of salt. So what happens when we put water-based ink onto salt? The salt tries to pull the water out of the ink, right? So that's how that that um, base of white ink is is staying up on top of the shirt is it's it's drying from the bottom up just like when, when we talked about uh, flash curing when you're screen printing it you're 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 basically drying the ink from the top down with direct to garment it's drying it from the bottom up and and, and by the way I don't know if we emphasize this enough all direct to garment printers require you to pre treat your shirts. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's as I said, it's it's basically salt water. Now, can you mix up your own salt water and spray it on a shirt and get a print? No, because of the other chemistry that's in that solution. Excellent, well said. I think that uh, it's important to know a little that bit of Elmer's glue and stuff like that too. <laughs> <laughs> I said binders, glue is a binder. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> a lot of people think that's what it is, though. Just yeah. people think it's just uh, some kind of a glue. Uh, because yeah. of uh, the consistency of it. But. And one of the things yeah. that we've we've uh, tried to be true to is to, to explain that there is an Epson product that has an Epson authentic and genuine pretreatment solution. And there are other third party pretreat solutions. I'm not smart enough to know the difference. They all claim that, you know, theirs is the best and it works the best. Um, but just to be clear, Roy, in our Speed Treater TX, are there any limitations to any pre-treat? You could use any solution. Is that true? Uh, as far as uh, regular cotton-based pre-treats, yes, that is correct. If you wanted to use a polyester pre-treat, you need to modify the pump and the spray nozzle. Okay. Because it's actually a thicker solution and it takes a little bit more force to move it through the machine. Perfect. Okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure that, that we were clear on that. So when we think about that, that kind of leads to my next question, which was, are there different pre-treat solutions? And you just brought up the fact that there is one. Uh, maybe Terry, you could start and leave some room for Roy and we could figure sure. out what, what are these different kinds and, 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 you know, what should I know if I'm, if I'm new to DTG printing, I don't want to be overwhelmed. Epson sent me a, you know, our equipment zone sent me this, you know, big, <laughs> this big bottle or this big box of pretreatment solution. Well, that's cool, but what is it? What else is there? What should I know? Well, the, the thing about pretreats is they are specific to the ink system you use. So an Epson pretreat is matched to the Epson inks. Now, will it work with some other printers? It would. Uh, you'd have to do some experimenting. But, you know, the best example of this is uh, our friends over at Image Armor. Uh, they have a couple of different dark shirt or color shirt pre-treats. And, uh, and Brian, the owner over there uh, at a trade show, uh, showed me a picture and he said, someone uh, is printing with an Epson F2000 and having trouble and using our pre-treat. And, and he said, well, what do you think? 
And of course I said, is it Image Armor Ultra? And he goes, exactly. They were just using regular Image Armor for dark shirts. Doesn't match with the Epson ink systems. Only the Image Armor Ultra matches with the ink system. Uh, same with the Brother machine. It, it uses the Ultra. The standard pre-treat uh, that they offer is for those DuPont and similar types of ink systems, usually in the converted over paper printer uh, arena. Um, we talked about printing uh, pre-treat for white shirts. There is a specific pre-treat for light color garments uh, that we at Equipment Zone carry and a lot of other folks do too. That is an Image Armor product. And, and of course, as Roy mentioned, there's, there's polyester pre-treat. Um, that's, that's something that we at Equipment Zone don't, don't carry. Uh, when we pre-treat, uh, when, when we attempt to print polyester, we just use regular Epson pre-treat. But Roy, I'll let you uh, continue on. Or did I cover everything? <laughs> no, no. Anyway, there was a question. Do we offer the mod kit? Yes, we do for the speed treater. And getting back to what Terry just said, do we support or promote the polyester pre-treat? No, we don't. And we did cover this in one of the earlier uh segments that we did and that was because it's not the fact that we can't get a good print it's the fact that washability is the biggest issue and whether or not we're going to get consistency with that and it's very cumbersome to go through the process of pre-treating for poly the proper way to colorize poly fabrics is to do dye sublimation which we also sell equipment for that and we do training for that as well so excellent answer um, so uh, Roy, yeah, and as far as the about... there was another question Go ahead. I was going to say there was one last thing I wanted to throw in. Another question is, have we tried other pre-treats? Yes, we have. Uh, we do sell the Epson. We sell the, uh, the Image Armor Ultra Dark. We sell the light. Uh, those are ready to use in reference to the Epson. Keep in mind, if you do have the Epson, make sure you're shaking the container prior to mixing or dispensing. If you don't do that, then it may come out a solution and you're going to throw your mix completely off from that, that point forward. Okay, so that is critical. Secondly is there's different characteristics from different pre-treats. So some are going to work better with blends. Some of them are going to less, leave less of a stain. There's one thing that most people don't know though is Image Armor Ultra Dark can be diluted with water. If you pull down their spec sheet on it, uh, they say one to one. I tell customers 25 or 30% water. If you have some lighter color garments that you're getting a little bit of discoloring and you're using that product, just go ahead and make a small sample and try that out and see if that's going to solve your issue. So it sounds like test, test, test again. And also um, on the spectrum of where where would I where would a dark garment be considered right so everyone this comes up all the time like well what's a light garment and then when does it start to become a dark garment how do I know so that I would pick the right pre treatment solution well in garment creator if you pick printing to dark garment with a white base that implies a dark garment and dark pre treat if so I'm really doing the a light is, garment white on this or not am i am i printing white exactly ink? exactly it, it, it's it's Can kind of confusing because rather than say color garments uh they use the term dark garments and and you certainly if you're printing a white underbase you, you, it would you know it's a color garment yeah 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 or well, a dark Francisco, garment what have you Francisco, congratulations on your order of 600. Before you do, I would print one side by side that's pre-treated and one that's not and do the test and figure that out. So the pre-treatment solution might make a difference, who, you know, in set, setting the expectation with your client. Well, let's keep moving. We've got lots more and we also have some slides and some examples to show. And don't forget, guys, we've got Roy here and you know he's going to be doing things um, live. So that's always fun and you never know what you get when you go live. But um <laughs> Uh, Tara, I'll start with you again. So can can I, is it possible to use too much? We hear this a lot. And I, and I know I've listened to many of your training seminars. And, um, you know, you've done a great job over the years of talking about too little or too much. It seems like it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for people. It is. And, and, you know, too little, we don't talk very much about that, because it's most people use too much pre-treat. And 
Uh, this is one of those things on the internet. If you're going to the internet for your training uh, on things, this is probably the biggest confusing, confusing part, uh, confusing information that you get from the internet. Uh, you, you know, you'll see people, you know, w holding up shirts that are just dripping with pre-treat. Well, it's too much. If there's a box, you know, a stiff box around your print, that's generally uh, means that you have too much pre-treat. And so, so what happens if you have too much? If it's way too much pre-treat, then all of a sudden you are printing on a layer of pre-treat and you're not printing on fabric. So pre-treat washes out in the first wash. That means if your print is sitting on top of a thick layer of pre-treat, your image is probably going to wash out as well. So uh, again, you know, and Roy's going to talk more and give us some examples of, of proper pre-treating, but I would say the majority of people out there who um, who run direct-to-garment printers use far too much pre-treat on their shirts. And, and before Roy jumps in and adds some value to that, which I know he will, it's always, always, always going to be my job to roll us back to the DTG printing index and say, don't forget, kids. We started this off with a great graphic, then we started with a great substrate, and now we're putting on top of that great pretreatment techniques. So if we're trying to, um, how should I say, compensate for a poor substrate, that's when I see people really getting into some challenges by more pretreat, more pretreat, and then more ink and more ink. And so they're trying to like, we'll, we'll get into that anyway, but uh don't forget the 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 easy dtg printing index was the genesis of this and so so roy back to you in terms of thinking through can i use too little can i use too much are there any washability issues what should we know roy what would you want our our listeners to know well basically we're trying to get the right amount of pretreat on the fabric and as terry mentioned if there's too much the pretreat's going to wash out some of the ink is going to go with it All, also if you're on the cusp of too much pretreat, it may not wash out right away. You may just have washability issues where you may get 10 or 12 washes, then the ink starts flaking off and coming off the fabric. So it may take a little bit of time. So don't just think that it's going to happen on the first wash all the time unless you're really dousing that shirt. And I always tell people if if the shirt looks like you poured milk on it, you put too much pre-treat on it. Definitely. <laughs> okay. That's a good uh, visual. That's a great yeah. visual. So basically what we're looking for is it, it, when it first starts to rain and the black top gets saturated before the water starts moving around and draining off into the gutter, that's where we're looking at. Just a nice mist over the shirt covering all the nooks and crannies of the fabric, depending on Again, the blends, we talked about that on the prior uh, um, video on the different uh, qualities of shirts out there. The thicker the weave, the more coverage you're going to need. It's almost like if you talk about a waffle versus a pancake, I pour syrup, it's going to spread out evenly. In a waffle, I got to go over each one of those uh, ridges to get down into the next area to make sure I got good coverage. So. Mm. And now, and now Terry and I both want waffles, don't we? Too? <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> do. <laughs> no, but you know, I mean, I don't mean to joke about that. Roy, I love that example. I think it's a yeah. really, really good visual. Pancakes are flat. We get a smooth surface. We get a smooth coating. Waffles, yeah. we've got the ridges and the valleys and it's not as smooth. We end up overcompensating and a lot of folks put too much pre-treat down and then they wonder why things are washing off or cracking later. I've even had people come up to me at a trade show and show me, I've only washed this three times and it looks like it's cracking. And I'm like, is that a transfer? And they're like, no, we pre-treated and then we printed it. I'm like, it shouldn't do that. So yeah. somewhere somewhere in that system, probably something's going on. Now yeah. let's get back. I just want to not to keep going backwards, but Epson, let's talk about that real quick. Okay. I know people try to save money. But if you're starting out and you're a newbie, mix one to one, okay? Stay with that and tell your experience with pre-treat. Then you can start venturing off into the other mixtures because more issues come up with not mixing it properly to begin with. Then you're starting out with a, a bum leg trying to get the right amount of pre-treat on the pre-treater. So mix Great. one to one starting out and tell you know what you're doing. And so for anybody who doesn't know, the Epsom pre-treat is a, is a concentrate. So you're going to mix it one part concentrate and one part distilled water. Uh, whereas some of the other pre-treats we mentioned come as a pre-mixed uh, uh, 
packaged where you you don't mix any water into it. And, and, you know, there's a lot of confusion there. We had somebody come up to us at a trade show booth and just scratching her heads why they couldn't, you know, their prints were coming out right. And, and then one of the techs said, tell me what mixture you're using. Uh, eight parts water, one part Epsom pretreat. Well, okay, well, there's the answer. <laughs> where, where did you get that? <laughs> so somebody was trying number to number one on the dial. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was trying to be helpful and they read it on the internet from a post yeah. from five years ago. <laughs> um, that's the other thing, you know, it, maintain your information base in a, in a timely manner, things evolve, things do change, new technology comes out. So pay attention to that. If, if something you read from five years ago, you know, test it again, test, 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 make sure well, it's going to And, and you know, that's a great, that's a great comment, Jay, because the uh, pre-treats have, have evolved substantially over the last 14 years. So things that, you know, a, a lot of things that people do today incorrectly were based on inferior pre-treat products from the past. A hundred percent. And we're going to get to two of those specifically in an upcoming question. On my next question, and thank you for several of the comments about discoloration, about yellow tints, about light colors do this, dark colors do that. Let's try to dive in on that a little bit. Both, I have two experts who've seen it all, or most of it. Um, and so talk to me a little bit about why does pretreatment sometimes discolor or why does the shirt sometimes discolor? So we've got well, you know, both things yeah. going on. I, I'm sure Roy's gonna have a lot to comment about this, but basically uh, the biggest reason you see discoloration, well, it can be because you've used too much pretreat, but usually it's because that garment has been exposed to UV light, sunlight. Uh, and, you know, we, I, I remember one of the techs who was doing a training say that the, the person had pre-treated, the trainee had been pre-treated like two dozen shirts and sat them by an open window uh, to dry. And, and they were all discolored because the sun discolored the pre-treat. So you want to protect your garments uh, from, uh, from sunlight. Uh, at least until you do the first wash, because then all that pre is going to wash away. But I know Roy's got a lot to say about discoloration. Take it uh, away. Oh, well, okay. So anyway, uh, in reference to that, uh, you definitely want to focus on any light pre-treated garments with that aspect in mind. Uh, if you have any uh, companies that you're dealing with that are outdoor services, okay, lawn mowing services, and they're buying your lighter shirts where you're just using light colored pre-treat, they must wash the shirts before their employees wear them. Okay, prolonged exposure to sunlight is going to turn certain shirts brown or dark yellow or things of that nature. So uh, keep that in mind. It just doesn't discolor in a picture frame aspect. It will look really horrible and you're gonna get an unhappy customer. But typically if someone's gonna put it on and wear it and they're in and out of a building, in and out of a car, it's not gonna be that big of a deal in most cases, especially if it's a darker shirt. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, a situation where you have to wash the shirt as soon as you print on it. We, we wear shirts all the time. It shows that we've pre-treated and just printed something on and thrown it on, you know, so. Uh, and it's, getting and it's back to discoloration, some of that is due to dyes, okay? So some dyes get activated by heat and some do not. So when you uh, put pre-treat on a garment and you're moistening that fabric, if you see discoloration after the heat press, especially some blue shirts, red shirts, where they turn burgundy, then you can see after five, 10 minutes, they start changing back almost. I always tell customers if you can wash the shirt and it come, bounces back 100%, you should be okay. But if you can't, then you need to move away from that product and go to something else. There are manufacturers out there that are very sensitive to the DTG environment and they are using dyes that aren't going to be as sensitive as you know your average product that's out there. So that's again, testing, making sure you have the right product, and I'm not scolding anybody, but I would always tell a uh, customer of ours, never let your customers dictate what products you're gonna print on, or don't let them bring something into you because that goes and throws everything that we're trying to teach you out the window. Uh, Cause they may bring in a product that you, is just not gonna work and you're gonna take it in anyway, cause you wanna save face. And ultimately you're gonna do a horrible job or ruin product, which I hear all the time. 
close out on a certain number of shirts, my customer brought them in and I've ruined five. How do I correct this issue? You know, you're, you're pretty much in a bad situation at that point. Yeah, we chuckle because we've all been there, both as the buyer and as the production manager. I know Terry talks about this all the time. Terry, what, what, where was the sale and what did they find? <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, I'm printing these red hoodies and, uh, and I, I just can't get a bright enough print. And, and uh, I, I don't understand, you know, do I need more pre-treat? Do I need more white ink? Well, well what kind of shirt is it? What's the fabric? Uh, well, Sandmar was having a sale. Because they don't want to tell me because they know when they say Sandmar was having a sale, it's a 50-50. And, right. and can you make it work? You can kind of make it work, but it's never going to look like a shirt, a, a hoodie that's 80-20 or, or has a 100% cotton facing on it. So, yeah. but yeah, that's okay, <laughs> Sandmar so, was having a sale. <laughs> so just to be quick and just to be clear, we don't need to dive deep, but do I need, this is a question from Gavin, do I need to wash the t-shirt before people wear it? period uh, i say no no but you right no no but I keep in mind one thing though is there is residual dyes and chemicals in all fabrics prior to you washing them anyway even if you buy them at the store because everybody yeah, yeah, true, true. pulls product that has been gone through a dyeing process some of them go through enzyme washes but for dtg industry a lot of them do Otherwise, it's going to come right off the conveyor. They're going to cut the fabric. They're going to sew it. They're going to put it in a bag or they're going to send it to someone to decorate. And then they're going to send it to their customer. That's why no one ever tries to wash a brand new red shirt with any light colored products or blue jeans with uh, any other colors unless you got some old blue jeans you want to revitalize and you throw them in with the new ones <laughs> yeah no 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 no. so the reason i'm asking you guys this is obviously i'm i'm getting some questions and some chat and so so this still applies and these are great questions depending on sweatshirts depending on hoodies depending on the substrates we have tracy martin who said we pre-treated had no staining we printed we dried and cured properly still no staining or no no discoloration but a short time later the stain showed where there was a box and there was pre-treat. Is there a way to avoid that? Well, that Roy, I'm going to say that's issue. probably too much pre-treat, but I'll let you jump in. Yeah, that could be, or it could be related back to UV, too much UV exposure uh, before washing the first time. Okay. Especially if she's gone through the complete process. Pre-treat cure, print cure, and still no change. Then it appears later on. It's usually probably because of UV. Somewhere in that process, uh, it got exactly. Some and what we see happen all the time this is what I tell customers if you're in a storefront and you're doing samples, you must take the shirts home and wash them. Do not hang them in the window if you're not going to do that because they will discolor. Well, and you know, with hoodies too, a lot of folks don't wear a hoodie one time and throw it in the wash, They'll, they're going to treat it like a jacket and maybe wear it out outside four, five, six, eight times. And, and so that's more UV, which might be uh, Tracy's issue as well. Yeah, and I have mm -hmm. a lot of clients who will say, just to be safe, I'm gonna go ahead and wash these before I even give them to the client. I don't want them to accidentally be part of the problem. You know, we don't wanna set them up for failure. And if you wanna go through that extra step, I'm not telling you not to, I just think that uh, that's an extra step. <laughs> well, I would say uh, there's a lot of people that do online retail that put cards in with the uh, products, especially the ones that are more prone to discoloration, that it's been chemically tr treated to optimize the quality of the print, the vibrancy of the colors, the shirt must be washed before you wear it. Your customer should be doing the washing, not you. That's actually gonna slow down production and add a whole nother expense to your business. And nobody really does that. So I yeah. wouldn't do it or start doing it. Well, I'm not gonna tell you to do it or not do it. I just want you to be aware of the options and know what the right yeah. answer is. So exactly, I'm, with you. I'm not dictating. You know, I know, I'm with business. you, I'm with you. We're, <laughs> this is the nature of all of our trainings. This is like, well, I would do it this way. Well, I would do it this way. It's like, okay, yeah. there are options. What we're trying to do is give you <laughs> correct information so then you can know what you prefer to do um some are fine like you know gavin said he's fine doing the extra step i wouldn't i would if i had to i would have a hang card or something in the box clear instructions here's what you should do here's what you shouldn't do um terry real quick so we have time for our slides we have time for our live printing and examples um can i store pre-treated shirts 
you you can store them. And and I, I encourage people when you have downtime to go ahead and pre-treat a bunch of shirts. So just a quick example, uh, our, our friends over at Image Armor pre-treated a dozen shirts and every month with their Epson F2000, they printed the exact same graphic. And every month, every shirt looked exactly like the first shirt they printed. So that was a, a, a real life test to show that that you can uh, you can store pre-treated shirts. And and I think Roy is going to talk to you about how to store those shirts. Yeah, typically I just tell customers to get a black trash bag, make sure the shirt's completely dry, line their case that they got their shirts in with that bag, throw the shirts in there. Uh, if it's going to be a long period of time, okay? If you're going to use them in a couple days, you could just leave them out stacked up somewhere away from the windows and they'll be fine. But if you're going to, if you happen to do some shirts for a job ahead of time and that job fell through and you got stuck with them, uh, just put them in the box, just throw the uh, plastic over. Don't like tie it in a knot, let it breathe. And then just close the lid, just like normal, just flap it over. And then those will last over a year, no problem whatsoever. You can pull them back out. We're keeping the UV off. We're keeping the dirt and dust off of them as well. When, awesome. we, uh, when we do trade shows, we'll pre-treat hundreds of shirts. And uh, what we don't print at a show, if we, if we have any more, we'll send them on to the next show that might be three weeks later. So we do this all the time. And they're not going to have any issues with shop lighting, right, Roy? Uh, it depends. Some of the newer lighting that uh, outputs UV spectrum, there could be uh, degradation to the pre-treat over time. So keep that in mind, especially with the newer type of uh, bulbs they're using in some of these buildings. If they're considered sunlight type uh, light output, then that's going to have a UV spectrum and it's going to degrade the uh, pre-treat gotcha. or discolor it. So let's keep rolling through these. A couple more questions before we go into some slides, examples, and some live printing. Um, first of all, thanks again, everybody, your questions. I'm trying to do the best I can and, and juggle all this. You're doing great. Don't, I, I don't quite feel overwhelmed yet, so this pace is good. So <laughs> don't start blitzing me now. But um, it, it gets asked every time we do a session like this or we're at a trade show. Um, and I know in the sales process, Terry, when you're talking to clients, they always ask, you know, can I, can I, pre, can I, can I cure or dry my pre-treated shirts? on a conveyor belt, or does it have to be a heat press? No, you can definitely uh, dry them on a, on a conveyor belt. The, the difference by using a heat press is it's gonna, it's gonna lay all those fibers down and kind of stick them down while it's wet. But uh, you're gonna have a, a, a totally acceptable shirt if you dry it on a conveyor dryer and then just hit it with a heat press for five or 10 seconds before you print, just to lay those fibers down. It's just gonna, it's just gonna enhance the quality of the print. Uh, Perfect. Well said. Just to jump in and add something to that, the five or 10 seconds that uh, Terry mentioned, I throw in, it depends on where you're located. The higher you, the humidity in your environment, the more time you need to press that shirt to pull the moisture out while you're pushing the fibers down. So if you're in Louisiana and it's, you know, sweating on the inside of the windows after a little while, you might want to pull some moisture out of that shirt. Those shirts may wick moisture back up in about 30 minutes as well. So you wanna make sure that gets pulled out because moisture can cause issues with the uh, white setting up properly when it hits that pre-treat layer. If it's wet salt versus dry salt, it's not gonna work well if it's wet salt, okay? That's for our friend Dane down at Great Dane Graphics in New Orleans, who also has an Epson direct camera printer. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, that go. humidity, and, and good point, Roy, because the, the three of us are desert rats living here in Phoenix, Arizona. Exactly. Our, our annual humidity is probably somewhere between 7 and 14%. Um, right. So it's foreign to us to have to worry about, you know, that that shirt could actually be absorbing more moisture between the heat press of yesterday and my print of today. So. <laughs> Uh, it also makes me question Roy using the the analogy of rain falling on a road. I, what do you know about that, Roy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. What about what about shirts that are not ideal? This comes up all the time in terms of uh, uh, other garments, other types of apparel. What should we know if we're if we're pre-treating something that is not, um, 
you know, standard T-shirt. What would you say to me? Well, I can. Uh, do you mind if I uh, or go just ahead. say no, one quick thing? Okay, there's three main fibers that we're going to be dealing with. We got cotton. Everyone is familiar with. We got viscose, which is basically a process uh, to create a fiber that encompasses rayon, bamboo, hemp, and modal. So they're all going to be a viscous type of product or viscose. Uh, that, that particular product is a synthetic uh, cellulose fiber, similar to cotton. It is actually more absorbent and uh, it absorbs dye and ink better than cotton does as well. So usually when you have a viscose blend with cotton, it's gonna print well. The big issue is the chemical and uh, dye residuals, or if you wanna say the, uh, you know, they do have some terminology. Other than that, I like to use layman terms so everybody understands. But there's a possibility of having oil or wax residuals in those. That's why some people say, do I pre-treat shirts twice? Okay, because when you do a pre-treat a second time or the first time and you put it in the heat press at that hot temperature, that pre-treat turns to steam breaking down some of that wax and oil residual, making the shirt more receptive for a second pass of pre-treat, okay? Uh, the other thing would be if it's a poly blend, you're gonna have, because the proper way to dye or dye poly is gonna be dye sublimation to get it, and that involves heat as well as a dye that turns into a gas. But the dyes that are used for fabrics is going to be a heat sensitive dye to penetrate into that fiber, and the thing you need to think about is where is my threshold of heat used for that specific dye from that manufacturer? That's why so many people, when they print on a 50-50, you go to print it, it looks great, and then you press it and you go, oh my God, what happened to my print? That dye reactivates and it migrates into the white base and it just, just dumbs down or really brings down the vibrancy of the print. So a lot of people will, and I, we covered this in our last episode, will pre-treat a couple times, cure at lower temperatures, and then cure the ink at a lower temperature as well. But there are a lot of garments out there that have higher heat thresholds that you could use. I know Cotton Heritage, everything that they have, nothing's going to migrate at your standard uh, cure temperatures. Uh, Next Level has a great tri-blend. It doesn't do it as well. so. Those are the two key components is what is my dye and chemical residual in the fabric? Is it going to cause me a problem? And is there any heat involved in the dyeing process? Gotcha. Thanks for the deep knowledge, Roy. Um, Roy at times will be officially known as the cotton whisperer. And he, he, will, he, will, he will give us the chemical breakdown of viscose at a later date. But um, yeah. I love that. It was great. It was deep stuff. It was good stuff. Our, our, our audience is going to be um, better off for having listened and, and know this. We're starting to run out of a little time. I don't want to rush you guys, but um, I'm, I want to make sure that we can just get to the last point here, which is the best way for us to actually apply this. Now, obviously, we are 100% biased, but because we were there in the early days to help pioneer this process, we actually do know what we're talking about. We know the truth. We've made the mistakes early on so that you don't have to. So Terry, what's the best way to apply pre-treatment solution? I know that seems obvious, but there's a lot of people listening that are probably <laughs> have probably been to the internet and heard something different. Well, you know, um, the thing about pre-treating is if there's inconsistency in your uh, in your pre-treating, like from one shirt to the next, you'll see it in the print. The pre-treat has a, a tremendous impact on the quality of the print. So a fully enclosed automatic pre-treat machine is your best absolute possible way to pre-treat a shirt. An open automatic pre-treat machine uh, is going to work the same, but you don't want that near your printer because when pre-treat touches ink, like on your print head, it'll cause it to cure and clog your print head. Um, and then if, if that's not in your budget, though, uh, a power paint sprayer will work. It takes practice. It's very, very messy. Uh, I know uh, um, Roy uses a pressurized pump sprayer uh, primarily for things like shoes, hats, things like that. Um, but uh, obviously, your absolute best way is to use an automatic pre-treat machine to get consistency through the entire run. And, and might I add, 
never, ever, ever use a paintbrush or a paint roller. That is the Hobby Lobby method of pre-treating, lays down far too much pre-treat. And so when you see that on the internet, and, and, and you know, Jay, one of the things where people say, I pre-treat and, and then I use a paintbrush, well, that means that your pre-treat wasn't laid down properly. It's either your technique or the machine you're using isn't laying down the pre-treat properly. So all you're doing with that paint, paintbrush is trying to even out the, the, the pre-treat. So that's a Band-Aid to something else incorrect in your process. I'm gotcha. sure that uh, you can introduce, comments on uh, that. You can, <laughs> you can introduce contaminants into your process by doing that as well, because you're, you're not going to get a new brush or roller every time. You're going to use the same one. There's dirt and dust floating down all the time onto it. It's sticky and it's just gonna create a mess. So I wouldn't use it as well. Uh, pre-treating, you don't wanna disrupt the surface of the fabric after it's pre-treated whatsoever. You're gonna go straight to the cure. If it's not done right, you're doing something wrong on the other end or not maintaining your equipment and nozzles. Again, as uh, Jay mentioned earlier, we do have a video on that. All right, great. Well, let me let me open up my slide deck here and we'll try to show some samples now. I think we've covered most of what we, we get asked on, on a frequent basis, either comes through tech support or Terry, Jeff and Amy and others are dealing with it on the front end as it relates to setting expectations in the sales process. Most of the folks listening today are probably somewhere in the middle. We have lots of clients that are listening here today. We have a few folks that are not yet clients. We hope that you can see that, you know, this is a process and we have you know, really done our, our homework because of our experience. And I'm the first one to say because of the mistakes we've made, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago. So through all of that trial and error, we've perfected the system. And that's why so many who are not clients of ours find our webinars very, very informative. So we're, we're glad you're here too. And we're here to help everybody because a rising tide raises all ships. Um, but the truth is I've got some slides to show. So let me do that now. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to go from this current slide here, which is welcome to the uh, pre-treatment is critical to success. Terry, you'll remember that this is that graphic that we've used so often with the easy DTG printing index. We've already had the first two sessions as, as Roy talked about, our earlier training videos are on YouTube. And today, here's what we've been talking about. Terry, is there anything you want to add to that third level there? Well, I think we've uh, pretty much covered the whole thing, you know, certainly no hand spray pump bottles, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the, the more consistency you can get across the entire surface of a garment, the, the better your print's going to be. I think you and Roy both did a great job of explaining that there always is going to be a balance. People have found suggestions like I, I, I literally a couple of months ago couldn't stop laughing when I saw someone who was who had pre-treated their with a with an automatic pre-treater it wasn't ours they had a different they pre-treated it then they dipped into a a, a solutions with a with a paintbrush not a paint roller and then they were going in the same direction you know making sure that they got even strokes and they were getting all those fibers to to supposedly lay down in the same direction and i just thought i'm not laughing at someone i'm just surprised that that became their best solution if that makes sense. And so we don't want to throw shade on people. They're trying to make this work and they're trying to find a, a profitable way to, to get through production. I just don't see that as effective, number one, and definitely not for, for production purposes. And the reason that I kind of giggled was in my mind, I was thinking of the slide. I was like, they're trying to lay down those fuzzy fibers, most likely because they're using a cheaper product. Now, not throwing you under the bus. Everybody's got a budget. Your clients sometimes are not, so you think, your clients are not willing to pay for this premium t-shirt, which is only about a dollar more. So Roy, we talk about this all the time. Are people really saving that dollar by going to an inferior, less expensive t-shirt? No, not at all. So basically, if you, let's take a Gildan for instance. I mean, I'm not bagging on one manufacturer over another, but they're the, one of the largest in the world. They manufacture in a multitude of countries. The nice thing is the country of origin is going to be on the label. We get calls all the time. I, I've done 25 shirts. I got 10 more to go and every print's coming out like crap now. And it's like, we look at the machine, nozzle check is good. We look at the 
uh, pre-treater. It's spraying down nice and even. Everything's good. And it's like, hey, look at the shirt. Oh, I just opened a new case and these ones came from Haiti or somewhere. And it's like, okay, let's, let's take that same shirt you just ruined and pre-treat it twice and see if you get a better print. Oh, wow. Yeah, that worked. That's why I do hear people out there. I just pre-treat all my Gildans twice. Well, I'm not going to try to drag this out, but I'm adding more pre-treat, more production time. Um, now, when I go to a, with the, the cheaper fibers as well, are going to take more ink coverage too. Not just pre-treat, ink too. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're going to spend that dollar in ink, plus you're going to be having a headache from bang, banging your head against the wall because you had to stop what you were doing and deal with this issue. I always tell customers there's nothing better than getting an order, grabbing a case of shirts, pulling it off to the shelf, doing the order, getting it out the door, grabbing another order, another color, another case, and just going right down the line with no hiccups. If you want to torture yourself and try all these different products out there, that's up to you. You know, like I said, it's not my business. I'm here to just tell you the facts and you decide how you want to run it. Love it. I love it. That's why I wanted to share this again so that everybody could kind of see that in case they weren't in one of our previous sessions. And, and for the facts, so that the facts matter, um, there are Gildan products, by the way, that printed very well. I, I got to say, we, we were quite impressed with the 64,000 uh, soft style Gildan that, was a, that has a tighter ring spun weave. It was a higher, uh, uh, I think, a little heavier weight uh, material. So when you hear us kind of taking a shot at somebody, it's, it's usually going to be Haynes or Gildan, and it's usually their their least expensive products. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to show you this for another reason. Those images that you see there that are in bold and in red, those are the four images that we tested this morning, actually yesterday. Thank you, Roy. And then I was able to take pictures of this morning that I'm about to share with you. So the examples that I'm going to share with you are a Gildan 5000, a Bella Canvas BC 3001, the Cotton Heritage 1082, and the Next Level 3600. Those are the next slides that you see are going to all show those four products. Um, so far, so good, guys. Are you ready? Uh -huh. Let's do it. Let's do it. So this is the next level. And what you see, and I'll describe this and jump in if you need to, Roy, if I didn't do a good job, the next level shirt that you see here, Roy did an amazing job of creating a little cardboard cutout template. And then with the same graphic being printed, he was able to lay down uh, what I would call a, a segmentation of, of pre-treatment solution. So on our pre-treater, using our dial and scaling from four to 4.5 to five to 5.5 and all the way up to six. And so in this case, you can see, and what I've done is going from right to from, from left to right, you can see I'm zooming in. So on the far right side, that 5.5 and that six, this is the same shirt. All I've done is zoom in a little bit. And you can see that on this next level shirt, the less pre-treatment you have, and then you can see it start to go higher. And the more pre-treat you have, the more vibrancy and the better print you get. Is that a fair assessment? Did I describe that, Roy? That's correct, yes, but we didn't do a four. We, we started at the 4.5. Oh, well. And went course. to five to five and a half and to six. Now, some of the higher quality shirts, we didn't go as big of a spread because we didn't need to. There's a bigger difference with a smaller spread. Correct. And where you see that like black uh, horizontal banded line, that's where there should have been no pre treatment. But Roy and I both were surprised that there was just enough particleization of pretreatment, a little bit of mist that still landed underneath cor uh, uh, Roy's cardboard cutout that you can still see some white speckling um, where that, that actually still picked up some of the, uh, some of the print. So yes. and and that's that why note, you don't use an open pretreat machine. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Well, on that note, what I'd also want to mention on this test, if you do this test, you may be, if you look at the 5.5 and the 6, they look pretty close. You may be good to just go with the 5.5 because as you're spraying, that mist is going to move both to the rear and the front of the nozzle as it's putting down the pre-treat, adding a little bit more. Uh, we're basically just trying to uh, funnel it into one spot, which uh, 
is difficult to do because it puts out a lot of pressure and papers moving around and I'm trying to, you know, stack things up to keep it from happening. So right, right. anyway, no, a lot of pressure. So a lot of pressure there. So the next one is the Bella Canvas. Same exact graphics, same process. 4.55, five and a quarter this time and 5.5. We were just trying to get some experimentation. Like you, like, you know, we're, we're walking the walk, as they say. Test, test, test. Trying to find where for this product would we need to be for pretreatment solution. And and depending on the graphic and depending on, you know, the 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 actual substrate, in this case the Bella Canvas, it, it's going to be different. And you can see that the you know 4.5 is 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 definitely lighter than say the 5.5. And we did the same thing for the Gildan. And again, this Gildan shirt, um, as you can see with your own eyes is definitely less uh, vivid, less bold, less bright. The opacity of the colors, it's much weaker, even all the way up to six. And I can't really tell that much of a difference between 5.5 and six. Can you, Roy, or can you, Terry? Uh, no, but basically this being a much more porous product, uh, once you establish the point where if you look at five and a half and six, you're not getting a big change. So what that means to me is I'm achieving about the right amount of pre-treat for that product. I don't need to go beyond six. I can maybe just be a hair over five and a half. And then my next job is going to be to focus on that white base, keeping in mind the waffle. I got to now fill that waffle up with white ink. So I see a lot of people automatically will shoot up to a level six. That increases my production time. That increases my cost tremendously. I focus on my white base. I never add color ink. I, if you got a good white base, you're going to get a vibrant print. Uh, if, if I do, you know, between level three and level five or six or four or what have you. And those levels you're, you're referring to, Roy, those are the levels in Garment Creator, right? Yeah, in Garment Creator. The white or the color lay down between four, five, and six is all the same. Level three is 720, 720, uh, and it's going to do four passes of ink. So the opacity is a little bit less. The four, five, and six are a 1440 by 720 with eight passes of ink. So it's going to be a little bit more opaque. So if you want a little bit more ink, then just jump up to that next level and then focus on your white base. So going to a 40%, the one thing to keep in mind too is don't think just because you add white that you're incrementally adding white ink, okay? every image has a threshold of a break-even point. So if I say uh, I'm adding 10% more white ink on level three or level five, anything from five down, level six handles the white a little bit differently. But um, with uh, the lower levels, what happens is, is it first redistributes your white ink, uh, taking it from more of a grayscale look to more of an even flood look, okay? So you, what I do is a cost analysis. I teach my customers, Go to level three with, with it at zero, what is your cost? Let's go to 25% plus white ink, what is your cost? If you're within two cents or one cent of that same price, that's your break even. Sometimes it's 10%, sometimes 25, sometimes as far as high as 35. So if I don't at least figure that out, then I don't know where I'm adding more ink because I have to exceed that number to add ink to the shirt after redistributing the gotcha. amount of ink that's hitting the fabric. That's that's why he's in so the Typically you're in the 40, 50 <laughs> right. and uh, with a guild in, I would rather do a 100% more white ink on a level five uh, than go to a level six and have a total of three passes. Cause then I'm gonna have to also do uh, pauses on level six, okay? I don't wanna have to do a pause. If I have the right amount of pre-treat to start with, and then I go and do the other uh, and get the right amount of white after that, I'm going to have a, a sellable shirt without going to level six. Excellent point. So Gildan here is, is in this particular order, the third shirt that we've shown. And, and for, for my eyes, um, not picking on the Gildan 5000, but this has, this has it's going to require the most workarounds, the most extra. It's going to be the neediest of the T-shirts where I have to babysit it and do other you know, techniques to accomplish that. And to compare that with your own eyes so that you can see, that's why I moved this one to the third. And then the next one is the Cotton Heritage. 
again, it's the exact same graphic. It's the exact same pre-treater machine. It's the exact same solution. The only difference was on here, we have a different substrate, a, got a cotton heritage, and we've moved up the scale, four and a half, four and three quarters, five, five and point two five. You can see that we didn't need as much pretreatment on this and uh -huh. that the colors are significantly brighter and, and more opaque. Can you see that, Terry? Yep. Oh, absolutely. We yeah. typically run our uh, cotton heritage at five uh, for doing demos and all that, just to be on the safe side. But in production, a lot of times I'll drop it to four and three quarters. Good. And, and, and he's just basically talking about the amount of pretreat we're laying down here. But uh -huh. this is exactly why when you walk around at a trade show that no matter who's doing DTG printing in their booth, almost everyone is using a cotton here to shirt. It's another real reason you got that. So here, here they all four are next to each other. Next level, Bella Canvas, Gildan, and Cotton Heritage. And you can see all I did was stack up those four high, you know, I, I zoomed in closer. And you can see comparing like to the, the Gildan at level six is still the lightest of all of them. And Bella Canvas, you didn't have to go quite as high. And then in Cotton Heritage, we didn't have to go quite as high. But what a stark contrast between the Gildan and the Cotton Heritage. When you see those next to each other, you know, I don't know. And, about and you, that's Terry, why but... you have to experiment, test, experiment, wash test. You have to, you, you have to put in the time and then stick to the, the, the lines of shirts that you're going to use. Exactly. Now, the next thing we want to do is Roy spends a lot of time on this when he's doing training. So we borrowed this from his, from his setup and training slides. And he makes a great point that what we want to do is before sometimes this is part of our testing, this is part of our own personal training, before we uh, lay down the CMYK level, we should take a peek at our first shirt and look at that white. How did that white base print? Now, I don't know how Roy caught this or if he did this on purpose. I'll, I'll let Roy keep the secrets if he wants to keep the secrets. But what yeah. I noticed on this Sturgis print was at the top, the text looks great, looks perfect. That's what we're looking for. But at the bottom, the motorcycle starts to wash out. It looks like something happened. So Roy, what happened? Well, basically, if you look at the image on the left, uh, I pre-treated this one manually on purpose and I uh, undercut the pre-treat at the bottom of the shirt, okay? So when I talk to customers, I tell them a couple of things. When you're dealing with fabrics, uh, we talked about the fabrics earlier look at your shirts close up okay get used to looking at hey is this a real bold weave uh is it a deep weave or is it something smooth like a piece of paper uh every one of those issues is going to require a different amount of pre-treat and ink and i want to make sure i get the right amount of pre-treat on the shirt first so this right here is a good example if i do a 10 second pause and this is what i recommend everyone do when they're starting out do a 10 second pause on the very first print of that design when you print it. So you can get used to seeing what a good white base is and what a bad one is for that design. Everything is based on the white uh, lay down of ink. If you don't have a good base to start with, you're not gonna get a good print, period. So you can see clearly if I look up close on the upper right hand corner, there you could see it's a nice lay down of white ink okay i can see the outline of the type okay if i look really close uh then you can see the it almost looks like i painted onto the shirt this is a distressed design so it does have a little bit of the fabric peeking through but down below if you look at the motorcycle tire and the forks to the right you can't even see that it's that bad until you look close uh, Terry, uh, when Terry, you look I, at the image to the right, it's like, oh my God, is it really that bad? Yes, Terry, it is. This, is. this is a funny story because when he sent me the files, they came in upside down and I couldn't even tell what that one on the right was. I was like, do I even have this right? Because I can't tell if that's a tire or not. And then I could finally start to, he goes, you have it upside down because I had the forks going the wrong way. But, but the reality here is that Roy's done a great job of kind of showcasing us. This is the time and the effort it takes in the beginning to really learn your craft, to really right. figure these details out. I, I wish it was just as easy as smashing that blue button and $25 bills come out, but it isn't that easy. And Roy's getting ready to show some live stuff. So I've got a couple more slides, two more in fact, and then Roy, we're gonna let you print live and kind of walk us through the process a little bit so people can see that as well. 
The next slide, Terry, I know this is going to excite you because I, I know you're a fan of The Walking Dead and all things zombie. Um, <laughs> Indeed. This is a site. This is the same image printed one time where half the shirt has pre treatment, and the, obviously the side of the right side of this design has no pre treatment at all. So when people say, Do I have to pre treat, or why is pre treatment important, or what does it really accomplish for me without being scared? Um, this graphic illustrates that. And uh, Roy, we, we won't go in on the backstory of this great graphic. Um, some people are probably freaking out a little bit, but it does a great job of displaying and explaining in a very visual way why we, we have to have pretreatment. And notice, not just for the white. I mean, look at the, you got to remember that CMYK is also going to respond and be sitting there on top of that white ink. And so it makes a big difference. And here's what that looks like zoomed in a little bit. Roy, did you have anything to add to these two? Before yeah, we... the only thing that I could add to this, or even going back to the prior one, you don't have to flip back to it. But if you don't have the right amount of pretreat, what happens? I see this on even our Facebook page. Oh, just pump it up to level six and uh, take your white to, I, I don't see any reason on level six to ever add white ink more than maybe 10%. I see people throwing out numbers 20%, 30%. If you have the right amount of pre-treat on your shirt, that white is gonna stay on the surface, even on a gildan at level six, okay? And the other thing that I, I see happen time and time again is customers will have white ink penetrate the layer of fabric and they'll thread their shirts for that reason, okay? I've never had white penetrate my first layer of fabric, okay? And that's because it's pre-treated properly and cured properly. So that white's gonna stay on the surface. So if I asked you the question, Roy, why do I see on other Facebook groups, people who are showing pictures of white ink that has gone through the shirt and is literally on either the back of the shirt or on the platen itself, what causes that? Uh, the, the two things, either not enough uh, pre-treat is one. And the second thing would be not curing the pre-treat amount enough. So if you have one that ha requires more pre-treat, it's wetter, it's going to require a little bit more time on the heat press. Just like if I put a towel in the dryer that's wetter than a different one, it's going to take more time on the dial to dry that towel. So the same thing applies to shirts. Another reason why customers don't put the grip pads on is they say, oh, you know, there's going to be white ink all over it if I put it on there. This was designed to speed up production. And I can load a shirt in a matter of seconds with this grip pad versus using the frame. Gotcha. No, that's great info. So we're using one of our platens as well with the rubber around it. They load just as fast as the grip pads. Just FYI. Perfect. But I did just print this shirt. This is a Gildan. So I could just show you one that's been done live. And the first one was four and a half. Then it's uh, five or yeah, five, five and a half. And then down at the six at the bottom. I, I uh, messed up that little yellow piece there for a second, but- What, um, that's unacceptable. Yeah. Well, Roy- Yeah, I hear, I hear you. <laughs> Why don't you take it over from here, Roy? We've got a few minutes. We're a little bit over, but I think this is important and people have been waiting to see the process live. If you want to give a, a, wherever you were going, I know you had a few things to share with us. Well, I'm going to go ahead and print a shirt while I got everything going on and I, another shirt. And this one's going to be Cotton Heritage versus the Gildan. But you all can see me now? Yep. All right, so we had a comment earlier to use a lighter shirt. We use dark shirts a lot or black shirts a lot, not because they're very popular, but they show a lot more of, uh, of the inconsistencies than the other ones do. So, but I'm using a light colored shirt. So you can see the pre-treat a little bit more. Now this one is an 85 cotton and a 15 viscose, by the way. So and I'm gonna go ahead and load a, this shirt. That's a cotton heritage product? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna load this shirt on the pre-treater. <clears throat> In order to have the right spray and everything, 
I want to make sure I have a little bit of an overlap. So if I just set my pre-treat gauges on the pre-treater uh, every four inches, it's not going to put the pre-treat down properly. So I did come up with just a piece of cardboard that I went ahead and cut one inch spaces in between. These are three and a half uh, by the width here. All right. So, um, and then I've got four blocks. So I can fit that on there and able to use that test target. So I'm gonna apply this on top of the shirt, line it up. Okay, and the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cover these lines with some parchment paper that I got available for me. And then the first one, I'm gonna just use a big piece of cardboard to keep that parchment paper from flying around. I'm going to set my dial to four and a half. I'm going to make sure my knobs are all the way up and I have a span of about six inches roughly. So I'm not over spraying too much elsewhere on the shirt. Okay, and then I'm going to just close the drawer and I'm going to go ahead and hit start on that. Obviously this morning I did take my nozzle out of my distilled water mixture and was able to uh, make sure that it was spraying properly. That's key. Uh, you don't want to have to uh, do anything with that. So got a little bit of napkins here to catch some of the overspray so I don't make too much of a mess. So now I'm going to just move that back, take this other white piece away, and then I'm going to move the knobs six inches forward, okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and put a piece of cardboard to hold this one down. I know this is, seems like a pain in the butt, but if you're deciding what products to carry, I always tell customers, don't just start taking orders for anything. Decide what your core products are gonna be and stick with those. Uh, it's your business for the DTG process. These are the colors and products we offer. Get your orders that way versus whatever you want. Here's a magazine with 20 different uh, manufacturers and colors. Because you do that, every time a customer places an order, it's going to be a shirt and a color you don't have in stock. And then you got to turn around and order it. Slowing down. So I just set my dial to five, got my... Uh, Numbers situated there on the top. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm doing a good spray on that. Okay. Use a little bit of napkin on that one. Now I'm gonna cover the next piece there and pull this one out. And then I'm gonna Put this last piece over there and cover that one. Okay, I'm gonna turn that one to five and a half. Move my gauges again. This is just so I don't have too much overspray all over that cardboard. I could have just left them full length and changed it, but it would have been a, a puddle of stuff on that cardboard. Whoops. That was a party foul. I was going to say, did you mean to leave that napkin in there? Because now you have a... Well, it was a little damp, so I thought a it well, would have stayed. A, a well-pre-treated napkin. Yeah, it missed a little spot because the napkin flipped over, but you'll see. You'll see. Note the idea. So then the last one, I'm just going to go ahead and move it back. It's always when you're on camera that those things go wrong, you know. The other ones came out perfect. It just so this one, I'm going to go ahead and go to six on the dial. So now this one is cured on the white, you can see the different levels there. Now at six on the dial with the gill den. Now this shirt's from Nicaragua, by the way, 
and Nicaragua prints fairly well, or you know, El Salvador, South America tends to do pretty well with the Gildens. And then uh, the Cotton Heritage that I just printed. So basically, if you're trying to get an idea of what a shirt should look like as far as different levels of wetness, you could see here the top, the next one, and then my napkin, sorry about that. And then the very <laughs> bottom looks a lot more saturated. But again, on this shirt manufacturer, I know that I'm going to be right up there towards the top on the uh, pretreatment levels. Okay. So, so to be clear, Roy, just now that we've got that, that was for the purposes of doing the test, but if it, in a normal production setting, obviously we wouldn't have done all the cardboard lay downs and whatnot. And you would have known by now that the optimal setting using the speed treater TX with that particular garment, what setting would you have it at five, five and a half or six? Well, five it's to five or just a hair under five would be fine on the cotton heritage. Obviously on the uh, Gildens, I'm pushing a six or five and a half, five and three quarters. Now the thing to keep in mind, yeah, this seems a little cumbersome, but if you go through this, you start watching your white bases and you go, note back to that motorcycle. If I'm seeing a little bit of that stuff looking close up, I know I don't have enough pre-treat, so I'm going to add more. You don't have to actually do this. This is just an exercise to show you uh, what can occur, okay? Um, and kind of help you get to a, a uh, good viable print for your customer using the right amount of pre-treat rather than not enough, okay? So you can even see the four and a half there on a cotton heritage, you're getting a nice white five definitely. I mean, there's really no change. So going anything above, uh, say a four and three quarter five point. The reason why I, we do a five typically is your pre-treater is going to fluctuate throughout the day with, you know, the pre-treat blowing through it. The nozzle may be off a little bit on the spray and you don't want that to stop production. So I want to be able to go ahead and uh, not have to worry about that. So I just crank it up just a hair more versus being on the cusp of the right amount because I'm not actually putting too much uh, than, than uh, putting like over excessive amount of pre-treat. But if I don't at least get to the point where I got the right amount to start with, it's a mood point to start adding more ink or changing my settings to try to correct it in garment crater because my cost skyrocket at that point. The difference between level five and level six on a lot of full size designs if you were to take even this test print, you know, you're, you might be looking at a dollar difference in ink uh, going from level five to level six, you know, and you can cost uh, calculate that in your, your cost calculator to figure that out, depending on the design. And just to be clear, Roy, when you say between level five and level six, again, you're talking about this, the, the garment creator. The setting. settings in garment creator. Yes. Okay. Not, not the level of pre-treat on the dial. No. No. Okay. All right. Well, listen, I think we have gone a little bit over, but it's been well worth it because we have answered questions like, can I use too much pretreatment? What happens when I do? What happens when UV light hits? Uh, how do I dry these things? Can I use a pretreat, you know, solution here or there? What about this garment? What about that garment? Uh, heat press? Yes or no, Terry? Conveyor belt dryer? Yes or no, Terry? And you think about everything that we just covered and, you know, I learned some things again here, listening to you, Terry, and listening to Roy. And we're going to end it with uh, Roy showing us, uh, you know, a print coming off. And uh, we did record this. So I know that's the next question everyone's going to ask. And you might want to fast forward through some of those parts just to get to the piece that you want to re-listen or share with somebody in your production team. But before we go, Terry, I want to kick it back over to you. Is there anything else that you want to add or summarize to this, to this training session? Well, you know, as I uh, have mentioned already, Jay, the the critical uh, one of the critical parts of this entire process is pre-treating. If you get this down, uh, it's going to make a substantial difference in the quality of your prints. So, 
Uh, I do did see that someone asked about how long do you dry the pre-treat and, and it's going to vary. Uh, you're going to have to do some experimenting, uh, but but the, the shirt needs to be completely dry in the print print area. So, uh, but beyond that, it's, as I said, it's a critical part of the process. We have a couple of more of these sessions coming, Jay. We do indeed, but we're trying to spread them out a little bit. Uh, every other week is about our good frequency right now. And as we are building on our easy DTG printing index to make sure that folks can understand all of these variables are relational and they build on each other. And so again, going back to the graphic and then figuring out the substrate. Now we've covered here in depth with the pretreatment solution uh, process and how that affects the designs. And so you can tell, and I hope that our examples were, were clear enough for us. If you still have questions, uh, I wanna make sure that you get those answers. Um, we do get a copy of the chat. Roy and I usually will review those. And, and if you'd like, you can always um, reach out. Get the, a copy of the questions and answers, not the chat. Yeah, that I'll make sure. Uh, yeah, I, I have secret ways, Roy. I'll make sure that people okay, can see ways. that chat dialogue. <laughs> But, but one of the things that you can do, and, and I want to give a compliment and a shout out to several of the participants here today. Thank you for hanging with us um, and, and for contributing, because I saw a lot of people chatting back and forth and sharing what they're doing and how, how they're able to achieve some of these results, which is also always awesome, um, because it gives another reference point. And that's exactly what happens on our private Facebook group. So we created this Epson F2100 DTG users group specifically for that. Now, Roy and I can't be in there and Terry can't be in they're monitoring everything every day, but we're in there almost every day and for sure several times a week trying to contribute, trying to clarify, trying to summarize, add value where we can. This is a great group. All of you should be joining this group. All you need to do is request, answer a couple of quick questions, and Roy or myself will, will grant you access. This is not a place to sell your used equipment. If you even try, we'll just immediately delete that. Um, and and no, one, no one should need to be selling their used equipment. They should be making so much money that they should be calling Terry asking for a second printer or a bigger printer. Right, Terry? Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's so great. But this is exclusive to Equipment Zone. There are other really good groups out there too. We just wanted to be able to kind of control one where we could create an environment of support, of training to give value first, where people could cheer each other on, share their fears, share their successes too. So I know that that's a big deal for people because they, they go, I, I'm going crazy. I don't understand this. And somebody's like, same problem happened to me. I did this you know, problem gone. Roy, what were you going to say? A, there was a question on whether or not someone can join from out of the country. Uh, typically uh, overseas, we typically don't let people in, but from Canada, uh, just go ahead and answer the questions. Okay. If you don't answer the questions, most likely if you're out of the country, we won't let you in. Okay. We're, so, we're always willing to, to bend the rules. And since it's our group, um, those, yeah. are, those, are, those are guidelines, not rules. And if you've participated in a few of these webinar events, we, we, of, of course, we're going to be more willing to do that. The reason that we don't typically admit people from outside of the U.S. is that because it creates a lot of time zone conflicts and people you know, expect us to be there waiting like as if it's a tech support channel. It's not tech support. It's basically just a place for us to you know, chat, hang out, ask questions and hope for great answers and support. Um, also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where you'll see it's all about the graphics. That's where you'll see the 2021 fashion trends. That's where you'll see great guests that Terry and Roy have had on previously or great topics that they've both discussed previously. We'd love for you to subscribe. That way you get a notification anytime we add a new video. Our YouTube channel is a wealth of information. And then if you have specific questions, I want to get a hold of Terry, Jeff, or Amy. Terry, is there anything else to add to this last uh, key contact phase before we go? We are always uh, willing to answer questions and help you. And uh, yes, we are uh, sales reps, but uh, our primary function uh, at Equipment Zone for all of us is really is really an education and training and, and uh, sales come second, so. Great. And, and the customers always... drive more equipment sales. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't supposed to say that out loud, Roy. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, it's the I'm truth. Kidding. It's the truth. I always hear that. Well, if you, since you've done this, and by the way, we do training for customers uh, that didn't purchase their equipment from us. Uh, you can call 
our Jersey office and set up an appointment. I train probably one to three people a month uh, that just pay for training because they got inadequate tr training from our competitors. Uh, it does, it is chargeable, but uh, it's well worth it. Awesome. Well, Roy, you did a great job. We appreciate you too, Terry. Um, the talent, Terry Combs. And uh, I'll, I'll just say one more time, appreciate all of the work that you guys put into these uh, webinars. And I know from the chat and from the questions um, that, you know, people appreciate it. So I, I, I'm grateful to be able to work with both of you because I know that you care. You're not just here to sell equipment to people and then, you know, turn and burn. Roy, and here's the uh, final print for the light gray shirt. Came you can kind of see. Uh, and what we may do uh, is upload this to our website where you can download this test target if you want to use it. Uh, that's already configured for Garment Creator. Again, it's standard uh, dark garment level three. Nothing special, nothing added. Okay. Excellent. Awesome. Well, well thank you, Jay, also for hosting yet again. And uh, my pleasure. And we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. We're going to sign off for now. Take care. Be All good. Right. Thank you. Bye bye.